Imagine if there was no art in the world. How would we feel? How would we feel if we had no music, no dance, no literature, no painting, and no sculpture? It would be horrible. I can't even imagine how we could exist. Can you? But art doesn't have to be man-made. Think about a sunset or a lovely warm day with the clouds billowing in the soft wind. This is art, and it makes us feel good. Art is the soul of who we are. It's part of who we are as human beings. It separates us from animals. It's part of the fabric of being a human being. When we see a beautiful piece of art or listen to a beautiful concert, it makes us feel good. For me, creating a piece of sculpture is an emotional experience that opens all the doors of my very being. This creativity is hopefully transferred to you, my audience, so you are touched by it. Touched in an emotional way, a psychological way, even a physical way, my public art sculpture is free and available to everyone, no matter your artistic knowledge, socioeconomic background, or age. It is for the public. It's for you. It's for everyone. You can not only touch it, but interact with it, understand it, learn from it, and take pleasure from it any time, day or night, every day of the year. It's always there for you to enjoy, no matter who you are. If we were to go to the public garden, we'd see lots of kids patting my sculpture of the ducks, climbing on them, kissing them, hugging them, and pretend feeding them. Often I try to make my work teach a lesson. My sculpture of Make Way for Ducklings teaches a lesson about keeping promises. The tortoise and hare in Copley Square teaches a lesson. Slow and steady wins the race. Eeyore and Pooh and Piglet at the Newton Free Library. There's a wonderful lesson to be learned from Eeyore, who took his destroyed birthday presents and made them into something positive. He took the stick with the broken balloon and the empty honey pot and made a game of them. I am probably one of the luckiest people you've ever known because I have a profession that I love and continue to be able to do. Sculptures are lasting structures, physical entities that can actually be touched and interacted with for centuries to come. Those who know my sculpture make way for ducklings often refer to me as the duck lady. Others may know of my eight-foot dragon in Dorchester and Naples, Florida. You may know me as the dragon lady. Because I had the idea and helped raise the funds for a 40,000 square foot world-class skate park under the Zagan Bridge, you might have heard me refer to as the skateboard granny. As I said before, the world is one huge museum. You should explore it. My four kids call me mom, my 11 grandchildren call me nanny, and my friends, they all call me Nancy. All right, everybody, thanks for coming. Before we do uh, the formal introduction, if you want to reach under your chair, if you have a lucky duck stuck to your chair, we have a Nancy Schoen gift for you. It's a square, It's a, if you feel a square, square piece of paper has a duck on it. <gasps> we have, oh, we have two lucky ones. Thank <laughs> you.
Okay. <laughs> Sorry to the people on the right. Um, <laughs> I'm sure there's a chair over there, though, somewhere that has one. Um, so I want to welcome everybody tonight. Thank you for coming. Um, I am Jamie Jurgensen. I am the library director for the Wellesley Free Library. Uh, I hope you had a chance to see the short video that was looping before we started this presentation. It helps set the, sets the stage as Nancy Schoen uh, shares a history of her work and the importance of art to human connection. Um, it has been my honor to witness Nancy's creative process from concept to completion of her sculpture, Reach for Knowledge. Prior to meeting Nancy, I was in awe of her work and now I'm just in awe of her like entire existence. <laughs> uh, she is simply a phenomenal human being. Uh, and this evening we are thrilled to welcome renowned artist Nancy Schoen, who will provide us with personal insight about her body of work, which now includes a piece at the Wellesley Free Library. And you will see it Saturday at the unveiling. Uh, after her presentation, there will be an opportunity for Q&A moderated by Beth Sullivan Woods. So without further delay, please welcome internationally known artist, Nancy Schoen. Um, I'm gonna sit down, but I wanna just, um, can you hear me, am I okay? There's nothing so terrible is when somebody's talking and you can't hear what they say. And I have terrible hearing, so I appreciate it. So if you can't hear me, let me know. <laughs> um, I just want to say one thing, um, or quote one person, Jamie, whom I feel is very, very responsible for what's happening Saturday <laughs> and what has happened these two years. Jamie said, art is a natural extension of and enhances the or a library's mission. And that was the first thing that I heard from Jamie when we talked. And I have to quote it, and I want you all to quote it. I wish it was on the sculpture, but anyway. <laughs> So, okay. Well, I guess we'll start. <laughs> um, so I've never done a PowerPoint, so if I screw up, it's okay. <laughs> or tell me. So you all have known me as um, the person who did Make Way for Ducklings in the Boston Public Garden. Um, but there was a whole other life before that. And I had to go, as we artists did, I went trudging down Newbury Street with my slides trying to get into these galleries. Then I would send in competitions, slides for competitions, and I had to pay. I had to pay to have them show my work. So. We artists in those times just didn't understand how these galleries needed us. <laughs> if they didn't have us, they didn't operate. Anyway, my life changed, and the Dean of Architecture came with his wife from England and their two twin boys. And they came uh, to MIT where my husband was a professor. And when they went strolling into the park, the boys, these twin boys, knew Make Way for Ducklings. But when they went into the park, the boy said, Mommy, where are the ducks? Which set off a whole lot of, a lot of stuff, as you know. <laughs> but we're not going to talk about that particularly, because you all know much about these stories about the ducks. And I want to take you on a journey for the next 30 six years after the ducks. One thing I might tell you is Mr. McCloskey, when he gave permission to do this, said, 
if you do, if I let you do this, I don't want it to happen anywhere else. These ducks belong in Boston. So anytime anybody wanted me to do this, I kept my promise, which was a very good thing that I did, because then I did all these other sculptures, that many of them that you see, where people wanted the ducks, and I said no. Mr. McCloskey said no. The one exception was, as you may or may not know, was Moscow. And he said, that was all right, because it was for children. Well, it turns out everybody seems to <laughs> to uh, think this was a very different time, as we know, with Russia. And it certainly was in 1990, well, in 1991. Anyway, I'm going to go on to what happened. So stay tuned as we talk about the next 36 years. <laughs> um, what am I seeing? I'm seeing that. This 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 one. OK. <laughs> I'll catch on. Anyway, <laughs> one of the things that happens with children who die, we feel so badly, and we want to do something to memorialize them. And this is always very sad. But one of the things I've tried to do is to turn it around and make these memorials fun for kids and for adults. So these are three different sculptures that I did for the Newton Free Library. And they came at different times, and they're about different, three different kids who, um, who died. It's very tragic. Another, uh, another very sad story was about this little girl who had just come to Wayland, and she was absconded with and she loved her dog, and she loved to go sledding. And so I thought, well, the kids are, it's in a park in Wayland, and the kids sit on the sled, and they pat the dog, and they hug it. So there's something going on, an interaction with this sculpture that's quite nice, and the kids really love particularly to pat the dog and sit on it. Kids love dogs, we all do, but uh, I guess we all loved animals, don't we? <laughs> this is, a, now this man wanted to, um, he wanted to do something for his friend, and he wanted the ducks, and I said, I'm sorry, you can't have the ducks, but how about we'll do some raccoons? So this shows kids, <laughs> I know you all don't like raccoons, but the kids like them down there. <laughs> so here they are, kids playing, and these five raccoons are following the leader, and they are living in these very magic stone horseshoes. And there's a whole story about the magic horseshoes that's about this particular sculpture. So it's turned around again. Unfortunately, this is a park across from the Brigham Women's Hospital, and this poor, this poor little girl was absolutely terribly murdered. And she lived across from the, the uh, uh, she lived across from the Brigham and Women's Hospital. In uh, uh, right across there, there was a house, and then that house was available and it turned into a park. So there's this little park. You might call it a, uh, well, it was a three-story building, so it's not very big. But anyway, it's very sad, and we use the butterfly as sort of a description of it. Anyhow, people go into this garden, and they have a lovely time. And they watch the birds go into this little uh, bird bath. Again, I tried to turn it into something that was positive. Now, along came, guess who? The tortoise and hare. And the tortoise and hare were originally at the um, end of the Boston Marathon. It's now, now it's moved to Boylston Street because it got so, so very big. Well, in order to be um, politically correct, I couldn't have a man walk of uh, running. I couldn't have a woman running, a woman running, but a wheelchair, there was no way. 
So I chose the tortoise and hare, which was a perfect metaphor, I thought, for uh, the marathon. By the way, I, was, I used to be a runner, and I watched the marathon from the time I was a little girl, because I grew up in Newton Center, and I watched that all the time. <laughs> so clients definitely loved, these clients definitely loved otters, and they lived in Martha's Vineyard. I don't know if any of you have swum in Martha's Vineyards, but my husband and I used to swim there, and we swam in the otters, which gave me the idea of doing this sculpture for this client. And they had a big house and had a big ceiling, and so I wanted to do something to fill it. So um, I consulted the library, absolutely. Where do I go for all my research? The library. <laughs> and I found out how to make an automobile. And it, funny thing happened. It turned out where I hung it, there was a, uh, a vent. And the vent was going, and so it made this wonderful, <laughs> this mobile move and move and move. And we had no idea this was going to happen. So that was one of these lucky things that happened. Now, there was a gentleman. This is uh, down in Naples, Florida. There was a gentleman <coughs> who, um, excuse me, I'm going to take a... There was a gentleman who um, had asked his lawyer to find a place for a sculpture for kids. And so he went to Cambia Park and found this. And I put in this eight-foot dragon. He's a scholarly, very sweet dragon, and the kids love him. And you can see that. It's wonderful that I have some pictures of kids so that you see how they interact with this sculpture. It was time for the Carroll Center for the Blind to build a new building that was going to, um, it was going to supply new tools so the electric, electronic world was coming in, and all these wonderful things were happening. So the, the blind had a lot more uh, facilities for doing new things and learning through, actually through digital, the digital world. Anyway, this was a uh, new building that was all about that, and it was called, the, and the sculpture's called Gateway to Independence. And you could see those bells, and people adopted a bell at different uh, monetary levels. And we raised thousands and thousands of dollars with this. And it's left as a monument to the new building and to uh, independence. <coughs> the, um, Mr. McCloskey's first book was called Lentil. Probably none of you have read it because it isn't as well known as some of the other books. But he was born in Hamilton, Ohio, and he was very reluctant to have anybody do anything nice for him, but we persuaded him. And uh, I was commissioned to do Lentil his, from his first book. Now, it turns out that McCloskey played the harmonica, and he also had a special dog named Lentil. So that's how this sculpture got its name, and they built this gorgeous park for me. Uh, it's really, you can see from the picture how beautiful it is. So another wonderful thing happened to me. <laughs> the other book that you are familiar with, I suspect, is Blueberries for Sal. And Sal is, of course, Mr. McCloskey's daughter, Sally. This bear is probably about six feet in length, and the kids love it. So do the adults. I have pictures of me on him, as a matter of fact. And he, uh, is, he has a beautiful little uh, pail, I don't know if you can see it, that has, is full of blueberries. And the state flower for Maine happens to be pine cones. So there's a spray, again, you can't see it, but there's a spray of fine, uh, pine cones. And then the black ch uh, cap chickadee is also there. 
and hit is the state bird. One of the things I try to do is to put things in that people learn something from, so they're just not, um, they're just not there. <laughs> so I guess that speaks to the fact that I'm a, um, a site-specific uh, sculptor, which means that I try to do something that has to do with the site. And of course, that's uh, what's going on here in this, with this new sculpture, particularly. Um, this is a, a replica, actually, of the uh, dragon that you saw in um, Naples, Florida. And it's in Dorchester, which is a very, this particular site is a very disadvantaged uh, place. And the woman who put this park together, and Gig knows about it, <laughs> is just, it's so beautiful. She wanted to have this, despite the area, she wanted to have a beautiful, beautiful park. And although you can't see the park itself, it's really quite beautiful. And I added books to it so that the kids might be intrigued with reading. And the books say things like science and arithmetic and spelling. And they can also sit on them if they want to, besides sitting on this big dragon. <laughs> and recently, a new, um, a new piece was put in just maybe eight months ago, the uh, owl and the pussycat. I bet you all remember the owl and the pussycat goes, went to sea in a pea green boat. <laughs> anyway, this was Edward Lear's famous poem. And <laughs> actually, we put this in with the idea that it speaks to diversity. I mean, how often does a owl and a pussycat get married? <laughs> and there's another verse that I, is not too well known, which speaks to the fact that they did get married and they had a child. <laughs> you can look it up. <laughs> um, one day, a woman called a nurse and she said, we want to honor ourselves at the MGH because our school has closed and we're the alumni and we're looking for somebody to do a sculpture. I said, nurses? Yeah, nurses. <sighs> I love nurses, says I. <laughs> she said, oh, you're the right one. So this is a sculpture of, to honor the nursing profession. And I was, I'm always, I was always interested in Greek drama. And so these nurses are Greek goddesses, if you look closely. And they are on a pedestal, and they are cast in bronze forever. Um, it's past, present, and future. The past is Florence Nightingale with her little lantern. And the present is a, a nurse holding, or a goddess, <laughs> holding a book because they're more educated. And in the future, we're talking about cyberspace and all of the things that have happened in the medical profession. So. That's that one. Now you will not believe what I'm going to tell you. <laughs> this little pre-aged, uh, pre-teen dancing girl was installed in a hospital in uh, Israel. She's not so little, she's six feet tall. And she's obviously a dancing child. Well, we put it in, and all of a sudden I got a call. The Orthodox Jews, the Orthodox Arabs said, no way, she is not properly dressed in her leotard. So she summarily was dug up, and she was put in the Sheba Medical Center in the children's room there, which is a different has a different attitude. <laughs> anyway, it was rather, uh, rather difficult time. <laughs> mm. 
when Alice Walton of Walmart uh, approached me to have the ducks in her new American uh, museum, uh, the Museum of American Artists, she wanted the ducks, of course. And guess what? <laughs> I had to say, no. I had already said to her, uh, I said to um, the people in <laughs> the National Gallery also, no, I said something to the president of Luxembourg. I said no. So I had to say no to her. Well, the curator and she probably decided on the tortoise and hare, so the same ones that are in Copley Square. And I think it's wonderful because there, there's my sculpture at the entrance to this beautiful, wonderful Crystal Bridges. I don't know if you know about it, but it's really quite an elegant place. And uh, the, the uh, hair is across the street following, but you can't see it. <laughs> but I'm really happy that it happened that way. In another beautiful botanical garden is um, my prairie dogs. You could probably imagine that prairie dogs in Oklahoma go together. Uh, and these are two... Um, prairie dogs that are kissing. Now I'm going to tell you a story and a secret. These prairie dogs are not kissing. They're smelling each other to see if they belong in the same burrow. <laughs> <laughs> but I call it friendship. Anyway, I, I have secrets that I don't tell. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I'll tell you another secret since we just passed the tortoise. Um, in Copley Square, if you see the tortoise and hare, and tortoise and hare, and if you put a mirror underneath the tortoise, you will see the initials of many of my grandchildren and children that I put in in 1995. <laughs> I'm missing some because there are more that have come after that. Um, this little boy is having fun on Myrtle, the turtle, on Mer Beacon Hill. And it's Mer on Mer the Myrtle Street Garage, uh, Mars the Myrtle Street Park. Myrtle Street. <laughs> uh, I don't know if any of you ran into the story about that and what happened, but uh, unfortunately, it had to get moved because the child um, was burnt. And the parents felt that it was a dangerous sculpture because it was so hot. <laughs> uh, I live in Newton. I was born in Newton. And um, I grew up knowing that there were 13 different villages in Newton. Newton's called the Garden City. I don't know if it still is, but uh, it was as I was growing up. So this is a daisy that represents, has 13 petals, and each one has the name of one of the villages. So people go up and they say, oh, I lived there, or I went there, or I used to live on that street, but now I <laughs> So people have, it's very interactive in what happens. And it also happens to be where the book slot is, so people go there all the time. Um, my, I'm very lucky. I have grandchildren and children who are all who are artists. Or actually, this is a piece that we did for Brandeis University, and it's called Seven Species. Now, seven species represent seven products that are re, are um, uh, are represented in Israel, and. They are from left to right, pomegranates, dates, barley, olives, figs, grapes, and wheat. Now each of my, I have two children and four grandchildren who are artists, one of whom is here. <laughs> and she, she is, um, anyway, <laughs> she did the pomegranates. <laughs> So each child or each family member was assigned a particular species. And they did their own piece around it. 
And I put together, as the matriarch, I put together a seven um, a candle menorah, which represents each one of the people in the family. Another, another library, free library. <laughs> so this is my little ducky in a puddle. And it's just the cutest size for um, uh, one kid to sit on. And it's in the garden of the Concord uh, Free Library. So it's called Millie the Duck. I forgot to tell you. <laughs> um, Hebrew College and Temple uh, Rayum merged. And I was asked to do a sculpture that would speak to this merger. And I chose the cyclamen because uh, I knew something. I knew it was the love flower. So if you ever give anybody a cyclamen, it's like giving them something for love. Why is that? Because the leaves are all shaped in a heart. Anyway, the sculpture is, shows a love, a dove, the love dove. And it's on a stone, which represents time, because we're talking about mergers. And this little dove has a seed in his mouth, or her mouth. And then you see it's dropped, and then there's a little seedling, and then another seed, and then some leaves, and then some buds, and then some flowers, and then a big merger of the flowers. Now, at the very end, I uh, don't know if you can see it, there is a bud which speaks to the future. So I'm giving it this sort of timeline. My daughter, Susie, and I are sort of responsible for this. Um, it was put in, it's, as you say, just this year. Several of these things were put in this year, as a matter of fact. And the Wabun Common uh, has this beautiful park, little park right across from the Anger School, and they wanted to put in a caterpillar. So we did. And I did sort of the basic work of it, and she did the things that make it as cute as it is. <laughs> and she did a lot of the work. So it was kind of a collaborative, which was the first time we had done that. But she's very clever, and she's, she was one of the uh, people who did the seven species. This piece just went into <laughs> this piece just went into the children's hospital, and you can see how a kid is perfect on it. <laughs> it's in the new um, the children's hospital has this new park, the. Um, what is it called? The, uh, hmm. the Wishing Stone Garden. The Wishing Stone Park, thank you. Did I say so? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Anyway, I, I love this. And it just went in, and I, it's, I think it's terrific. <laughs> uh, just ask me, I'll tell you. <laughs> Anyhow, guess who this is? So this is what they, the sculpture looked like just as it was being taken out uh, to the foundry. Now what happened as they took it out, and we have pictures of it that would break your heart and drove me almost out of the, I don't know, I was so scared. But they cut off the head, they cut off the arms, they cut everything, and they cut it to pieces. And this is what happens when you do a sculpture, you cut it up. The tortoise and hare have 22 different pieces that were put together, those two animals. This, I don't know. I don't even want to know how many. But they put Humpty Dumpty together again, and you will see it on Saturday if you come. And you can see it now because this is... But the, the clay doesn't begin to show how wonderful... Something magical happens with you cast something in bronze. I can't tell you what it is. But it's always a surprise, and it's always so special. This is a very unusual piece, and it's called Dialogue. And 
a nun called me from um, Taiwan, and she is uh, with a, um, a, a Catholic university, private Catholic university in Taiwan, and she had seen this piece dialogue, the small, a small piece on my website, and she said, you know, dialogue's a very important part of our, our culture. We talk about dialoguing. I would like you to blow that piece up to two, feet, two people who are six feet tall. Now, we're going from nine inches to six feet. That's quite a thing. And I said, you know, that would be very expensive if I did something like that for you. I'd be happy to, but not only casting it here and then shipping it and so forth. I said, I have a better idea if you want to do it. I said, I told her about 3D printing. Now, I'm sure many of you know about 3D printing, but you may not know its amazing capacity. And one of the things that they could do, I went to this man I use because I do other 3D printing. My little duck is a 3D printing. So you can go from nine inches to nine, to, I don't know, an inch. Um, or you can go to 20 feet, which is the thing that's so interesting. Anyway, I convinced her that if I could get the coding done for this, and if she has a, a foundry that would read this coding, I could send her through the mail <laughs> her sculpture, <laughs> which is what happened, and it's being built as we speak, and it's big. <laughs> so it's going into the uh, center of the, of the uh, college campus. This is ongoing as we speak right now. It has not been, it's basically a lot of it's been done, um, but it has not actually been done. The design has been done, it's been accepted. We're now in the fundraising portion. And I was asked to do something that has to do with the Italian immigrations to the North End, going from Italy to America. I don't know if any of you are here who have ancestors who came from Italy and did this some years ago because we were all immigrants. And so what I did was I thought about the fact that people, this was 1873 that this church St. Uh, Leonard's in the North End was built, and it was built by immigrants who came around that time, and that they're celebrating their 105th anniversary, which is why I'm doing this sculpture. So I figured people get off the boat, and they get on the gangplank, and then they walk to the church. So they went to North End, built the church. So there's, again, another kind of timeline. And as they got off, the boat, and they got on this gangplank, they left their footprints. And when they left their footprints, then you, as the ancestors, can walk in their footprints and go right into the church. So you see um, the way, you see behind me, uh, in order to get into the church, you have to go and you step in the footprints of your ancestors. The thing that I'm proud about this is that it's a continuum. It's going to go on and on. The next generation is going to go and put in their footprints, and the next and the next. Generation. Anyway, it's been very well received. I'm very excited about it, and um, I'm always excited about the next thing I'm doing, but I'm, I don't mean to minimize this. I am so excited to be here tonight. You have no idea. I have I, to have it done, and I love it. You're going to love it. It's, it's terrific. So thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.
So now's the fun part. Uh -oh. Nancy had a nice prepared talk for us. Now I have questions for which she may or may not be prepared. But we thought it would be fun to, since we have you here live, before people actually see the sculpture, to find out a little bit about it. And um, I guess the first thing is you, you showed us all these wonderful pieces of work, and each one has a story. Can you tell us about the inspiration for the piece of art that was commissioned for the library, and how you got to the idea? Well, it, it was a lot. <laughs> It was a long road. <laughs> um, when I first, when you, when you first um, came to me, you and Gig and Beth. who who came? I'm kidding. Beth Hensley. Beth. Oh yeah, Beth and uh, Mar was it Marla who came? I don't know. Anyway. The first, <laughs> the first thing that came into my mind was when I was a little girl, I went to the library. And when I went to the library, there was a librarian who came to me and she said, I think I want to introduce you to this, and she introduced me to Michelangelo. And at 10 years old, I fell in love with Michelangelo. And I, I think this amazing thing that happened in the library that basically, as I see me now, at 85 years later, <laughs> here I am as an artist. Now, I wonder if this had anything to do with it, but I immediately had that idea. You know, I loved coming. The library was always there. I've used the library for my research uh, before Google, but I still use the library. I will go in there, and I will spend hours. I have no... Uh, I don't have a zoo, so I have to go to the library to get photographs, and I would get photographs, and I'd Xerox them and take them home and use them as my research. So the library was my, it, and guess what? It was free, just like public art. Public art is free. Libraries are free. Do you realize what we have that's free? So, in a way, that's how it kind of started. But there was more. <laughs> you want oh, more? Oh, do tell, yes. <laughs> well, the, the way I start out with um, doing a piece of sculpture is strange. I make a long list of words. I don't know what the words are. I just roll them off. I have nothing to do. I, I think I was reaching for knowledge. I was, <laughs> I was realizing that there's the community comes. It's, it's a place where you can be quiet. It's a place where you can answer questions. I started answering all these questions and writing down all sorts of stuff. And I, I have no idea how it all happens, but eventually it happens. But I can't tell you how many iterations I made before I came up with this concept. And even when I did, I wasn't sure it was exactly right. But I think what it is, it's a universal uh, concept of reaching for knowledge. I think of myself as somebody who, uh, I think of life as I climb, I climb a plateau. Life is not a straight line, we know that. But, and my God, my life wasn't. <laughs> um, but I climb, we hit a plateau, we climb some more, we climb some more, we hit another plateau. But we're always reaching, and we're always reaching for more. We're always wanting, we've never gotten there. How is a piece of sculpture done? I don't know, we, t we say it works, who knows. 
but that's what happens. We get to a point where it works. So I don't know I, I, if that's kind of the answer. There are lots of, I could go on, but I don't know where no, you No, that's go. great. So one of the other things that's really interesting is public art is free, libraries are free, and you don't really control who's going to see them. So as an artist, it's, it seems that one of the things, even in your stories, you talked about how children would interact, how adults would interact. When you think about Reach for Knowledge, what do you hope people will see in it? Like if you're a child, what do you hope a child will see in it? Well, don't kid yourself. There's a 10-year-old inside this old body. <laughs> so, but... Um, uh, what can I tell you? I'm sort of losing what uh, the... Uh, when, when I do a piece of sculpture, I have an idea. I have a concept of what I think it's all about. It's clear to me, first of all, when we say it's free, everybody comes. It doesn't make any difference how old you are, how young you are, what color you are, what religion you are. You're everybody. And so each of us brings something very different to what we're doing. And um, I just, I think that's probably the answer I have because uh, I'm not sure how much I can say about that. Um, so I know I you believe, you yes, bit. I do want to help you. So I know you believe, like I think probably all of us believe, that art is in the eye of the beholder. And we all see things a little bit differently. I'm, I guess I'm wondering, we all like the little cheat sheet. What, what do you see when you look at this sculpture? You know, what, what, what do you take away from it? <laughs> Well, you have to realize I've been looking at you, it. Well, you've been living, you're the expert in this piece, so what you, do you see? But yesterday when I looked at it, I thought, that is good. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I can say that at this age, stage in my life. But, you know, there's something, as I said before, there's something about bronze and how it changes. But I just feel like... I wanted to talk about how knowledge is, we reach all the time for it. Somehow it was, it was uh, Jamie who came up with the idea of reach, the name. And I came up, I think, with to reach to knowledge or reach for, reach for knowledge. And there's something about that that is very personal. Um, I, I, I got a library card when I was a little girl. I was so, it was the biggest, most important thing I ever got in my life. What was this? This was opening all the things in the world was available to me. What did I do but one of the things, I was a classical, I'm going off. That's okay. I, uh, I, I was classically trained. So now anybody could go to the library and what do you find? You can go and you can find artists. You can find Michelangelo. You can find drawings. You can find all these things. The whole world is available to you in a library. And I think reach is really, it's a wonderful word because we're always reaching for our knowledge, for, for, for life. We're, I don't know. We're always wanting something more. And reaching is this word that is always there. We're always, it's, it's, a, it's an action word. It's, it's moving. And so I feel like the sculpture has done that. Thank you. So <laughs> I think the other thing people wonder is how, what really happened in creating the sculpture? What were the surprises as you went through the process? What were the challenges? You know, so I'm not, I, I don't create art, but I've written the paper and then I'm like, ooh, you know, things have gone a little sideways here. Were, those, were there those moments in the sculpture that we aren't going to see when we see the sculpture, but would be fun to know? Yeah, right. So the first thing that happens is, okay, I get the go ahead to do it. 
And I think, oh, that's easy. I know what I'm going to do. Well, I don't know what I'm going to do. And all of a sudden, I start doing something, and I said, oh, my God, what the hell did I get myself into? (laughs) (laughs) I can't do this. I don't know how to do this. And one of the things about this sculpture that I had no intention or no knowledge of what was going to happen was I had no idea. First of all, in order to, let me go back a bit, in order to do a sculpture, you have to be strong. And you have to, and I have to, I happen to have hands that are, I know how to, I like tools and I work with them and I use sawzalls and I use drills and I use all sorts of stuff. So you have to be strong. I keep myself in very good shape. I swim, I played tennis till I was 92. I did all sorts of things. So you have to be tough in order to do it and strong. And you also have to be able to, not only physically strong, but psychologically strong to deal with all the things that happen over the period of putting together a sculpture, talking to the people who are your commissioners, talking to fundraising, talking to all the stuff. But the physical part is what's really, you finally come to this, and then all of a sudden you have to build the sculpture. So you have to get, there's no such thing as a sculpture store. So you have to go to the hardware <laughs> store. So I went to the plumbing store to get pipes for the armature. I went to the clay store to get plasticine. And then hardware store for wire and for styrofoam and for nails and tools. And so you have to be very ingenious to get, even get started. So once you do, (laughs) you run into all these problems. Well, I was going to tell you about this particular sculpture, which (laughs) was really very hard. Really hard because you see the balance physically for that figure to be bending and for this figure to be coming to it. And what's happening between these two physically became a nightmare in terms of the balance. So any number of times I took the thing down and put the thing back and and I really struggled a lot because, you know, nothing, it looks easy, but we all know whatever we are, whatever our occupation or career is, it's always strong. Everybody has problems. There's nothing that's easy and if you're going to be successful. Anyway, this is what happened, and eventually I was able to do it. But one of the big problems was the figures are so close together, and I did not figure that out until it was too late. But I I wanted to have that because I wanted to have that tension, and it was important to have that. So it was okay that that's what happened. (laughs) So eventually I called in my daughter, Susie. I thought she might be here tonight. And I, because she's young, (laughs) and she was able to get into places that I couldn't get into. I just couldn't do it. So uh, I give her a lot of credit. She, as a matter of fact, did all of the um, base because there's clay on eight feet by four feet of uh, clay that had to be put on the base as a texture. So she's responsible for that. So there were, and of course, most people have helpers. I've never had a helper. I've never had an agent. I've never had all the things you're supposed to have. I write my own stuff. I do my own photography. Not always, but a lot of, anyway, I'm a one person something. (laughs) And so the sculpture's out there, right? And you saw it when it was installed on Tuesday. What are you proudest about it? Because you had that beaming look when it came off the truck. That was my scariest moment when they put a thing around it and lifted it up by its neck. I was like, what? But you were beaming. What, what are you so most proud about with that? Well, I guess what I talked about, I, I produced the tension that I wanted to. I feel that it works. It works. That's the, you know, the favorite word, works. No, there's really not much more to say. I, I just, it's, I'm very proud of it. And I know that you will be, and I know that the town will be. And um, 
hopefully, yeah. I usually feel pretty proud of my work, I have to say, because if I don't, I don't want to do it. I mean, I don't, I, I don't know. <laughs> the only thing I can say is um, I always feel that at the end of something, I feel wonderful. There's a kind of sense of relief, <laughs> too. I might add that one of the things I'm doing now <clears throat> in between all this, I've become politically very active in my sculpture. So I have produced <clears throat> quite a few very nasty political <laughs> things. <laughs> but I won't tell you about those now. <laughs> I'll have a show next year, and you are all invited. <laughs> all right. Well, Nancy, I think we are all so thrilled. Wellesley doesn't have a lot of public art. And so I think it will be a new experience for us. And the library is a place where the community does gather and walk by often. So I know you've done so many pieces at libraries. Is there anything else you want to share with us about why libraries are a special place for public art? <laughs> I didn't tell you to have easy questions. Uh, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I think we've really sort of covered it. Okay. I mean, it's free. It's, uh, yeah. Okay, I, super. I, I, think that, I, I don't think there's much more to say about it. Okay, super. If that's okay. That's okay. I think uh, this rarely happens. I have finished actually on time. Those who know me would know it never happens. <laughs>